So once again, welcome to the course, Creativity and Innovation Management. This is a very wide ranging, broad course that will cover many topics. And I call that a convergence type education. So we'll be going through history, uh, business, science, biology, neurobiology, sociology, uh, government policy, intellectual property, et cetera, that all relate to innovation, which is a very complex topic. And uh, this may very well be one of the most important courses you take because innovation is in fact critical to personal success, uh, company success, and societal success. If we look at the COVID situation, the only way we will get out of this situation is through innovation, actually. So this is a very important topic, a very important course, and I hope that you will uh, learn a lot uh, over the coming uh, few months in the coming semester. So as you can see here, The course will be split up into two parts, uh, fundamentals and history. And today we will be talking about what is innovation. And then we'll be talking about history of innovation, subsequent weeks, innovation and culture. And uh, the second part will be in terms of the applications and methods of innovation. So we'll be talking about methods of innovation, innovation society, and the future of innovation. So roughly two parts, the background, the fundamentals, and then the second part is the methods and applications of innovation and the management of innovation. So the first question uh, is what is innovation? So I'd like to go around the class and uh, raise your hand and uh, tell me what you think innovation is. Any thoughts? Uh, professor, can I answer? Yeah. So and please, uh, please say your uh, name. Uh, my name is Otto Murat. Good, afternoon. Good morning. And uh, for me, innovation is something that you can create uh, or use a certain item in a multiple ways that uh, was in a sort that it, it's uh, to using it in multiple ways. For okay. example, a, a can of bottle can be used as it's meant to be or in a different way for innovation as a, a gardening pot for something. Sure. So I would call that repurposing and repurposing uh, is one aspect of innovation, but that I don't think that that's a all encompassing definition of innovation, but that's a very good answer. Any other thoughts? Yeah. Uh, here. Is a answer? I think. <laughs> <laughs> can, can I answer? Uh, what's your name? Um, Cao Zetun. Okay. I think it is create some new thing, new idea, or new ways to do something. It's okay. An innovation. So uh, that is the most common uh, definition. I shouldn't say definition. That's the most common understanding of innovation. That it's something to create new things. And I don't want to sound discouraging. Uh, that's a good answer. That's the answer that almost everybody, 90% of people will give as a definition for innovation, to create new things. And that answer is actually wrong. Uh, and I'm not criticizing, uh, don't worry, this is not going to be bad grade or anything like that. As I said, 90% of people will give this, 90% of you know, educated people, thinking people, will give that same answer. So that's a little bit strange because everybody thinks uh, innovation is about new things. And the professor is saying innovation is, that's not the definition. And that's the purpose of today's class is to define what is innovation. Uh, now I should be a little bit more uh, precise. Your answer was not necessarily wrong per se, to be more precise, your answer was not complete. The complete definition of innovation is a little bit more, or actually significantly more, uh, 
complex than that. Of course, new things play a role in innovation, but that's not the same as innovation. So let's talk about what is innovation. Thank you for your answers. So here are some textbook definitions from business textbooks. Uh, Howell and Higgins in 1990, innovation is the process by which entrepreneurs convert ideas into marketable, uh, convert opportunities into marketable ideas. That uh, sounds like business speak to me, jargon. Uh, Paul Drucker, who was a very famous business guru, some of you may be familiar with, uh, wrote in 1985, the specific instrument of entrepreneurs, the means by which they exploit change as an opportunity for a different business or a different service. Now, Drucker is very famous, and he might be considered one of the greatest, if not the greatest of business gurus. And just so uh, you as students are not offended, uh, I think Paul Drucker is also wrong about the definition of innovation. So uh, it's, you don't have to be just a student uh, to not always get the answers right. We're always learning, etc. But the reason I think Paul Drucker is wrong is he talks about entrepreneurs. He talks about business and different service, but innovation is actually broader than that. And that's a really important concept that we need to develop in this class. Uh, all of you are in the Solbridge International School of Business. And most of you, of course, are aiming for careers in business and innovation is an important part of business. But innovation is a mindset. It's not something you turn on, you walk into the office and you start to be innovative and then you leave the office and then you become not innovative. Uh, if you look at all the great business innovators, they were also innovative in their whole mindset in their life. So you look at Steve Jobs, you look at uh, uh, Elon Musk, and it's not just about wearing a sweatshirt and looking sloppy. That's not innovation, of course, but their whole mindset is about innovation. It's not just a business thing. And then, as I said at the beginning of the class with COVID, we also need innovation from government. So we talk about Korea having innovative solutions to the COVID crisis. It's not a business. And then there are scientists and artists are also innovative beyond just being creative. So Drucker is wrong, or I should say incomplete, because he focuses just on entrepreneurs and business. And as a business guru, he should know very well that great business people and great business ideas uh, occur with a personality and a mindset, not just you know, a skill that you turn on and off. So Drucker is not entirely right. And then Luca and Katz in 2003 uh, get a little bit closer to this, but they use a lot of words and I'm going to simplify it in my definition, which I think is the, is the uh, uh, most precise definition. I'm not saying it's perfect because innovation is always all about improvement. And, uh, uh, but we'll try to really nail this down. So Luca and Katz in 2003 said, innovation is generally understood as the successful introduction, very important word, successful introduction of a new thing or method. Innovation is the embodiment, combination, or synthesis of knowledge in original, relevant, valued new products, processes, or services. So I think this is uh, the closest definition that we will develop over the course of the next uh, of this lecture. So uh, let me just. Uh, One second here.
Okay, sorry for that uh, delay. So the important thing to distinguish is that creativity, which was mentioned before about new ideas, uh, creativity is different than innovation. So the title of this course is interesting, Creativity and Innovation Management. And they are in fact related, but different. And one way to summarize this is that creativity is thinking of new things, new ideas, and innovation is doing new things. Uh, and that's one reason why innovation is particularly important for business or for governments or societies or individuals, because if a new idea is not actually done, then it's not innovation. So creativity are these new ideas, which sometimes people say that's innov innovation and innovation is the actual implementation, the realization, uh, the doing of those new things. So many people say, oh, that's a very innovative idea. What they really mean is that's a creative idea. Because if that idea does not become reality, if that idea does not become a product, if that idea does not become a successful business, then it be is just a creative idea and it's not innovation. So innovation has two parts. It's this newness as well as this implementation. And that's why we need management of innovation because we need to manage the making of reality of that new idea. So these are concepts that are related to marketing, uh, are related to business processes, uh, in addition to creativity and coming up with new ideas. So this in an essence is a very important point and that's why 90% of people get the definition of innovation wrong because they make it uh, a, uh, they equate it with creativity. So let's develop these ideas further. And we're going to go over the next uh, portion of the lecture on the many different kinds of innovation. So it, innovation is uh, roughly speaking, as I mentioned, the new idea is becoming reality, but there are many different kinds of innovation. And you may have heard of this, uh, we will talk about uh, invention, creativity versus in innovation in more detail, which we just discussed. Then we'll talk about product innovation and process innovation. We'll discuss business model innovation, very hot topic. Many people have heard of disruptive innovation. And so we will distinguish between disruptive and incremental innovation. Some of you may have heard about closed versus open innovation. So we'll discuss that as well. And later in the course, we will dive into all of these topics in more detail. Uh, traditional versus reverse innovation. Some of you may not be familiar with that. And then finally, and very difficult, is innovation not just to create a new product or service, but what are the organizational structures and organizational processes that ensure innovation. We call this organizational innovation. That's a very important topic for the rest of the uh, course. We'll be talking about societies. What made uh, uh, ancient Rome so innovative, so it became the Roman Empire? What, what made uh, some times during Korea uh, and Korean history very innovative during the King Sejong, some of you may be familiar with the history of Korea. Why is Silicon Valley so creative in the United States? Uh, also, Israel has uh, had aspect of innovation. So what are features of society uh, and uh, businesses that allow for innovation? That kind of aspect is very important. So this final topic of organizational innovation is a major theme of this course. So let's go step by step through this. As I mentioned, invention 
otherwise known also as creativity, uh, is not the same as innovation. And 90% of people will say that innovation is creativity and they mix those two concepts, but they're very distinct. So let's develop this in more detail. So if we imagine a process leading to innovation, the beginning of that process is in fact invention or the coming up of a new idea. And the beginning of this process of invention involves both artistic aspects, humanistic aspects, as well as technology and science. So science and art have to come together to produce uh, invention. And this is very interesting because most people think, well, a new idea is just a scientific idea. But there's also artistic aspects. Uh, and I'm not just talking about design, but about how this idea will intersect with human life and uh, the world. And so we have to understand the broader humanistic aspects of this early on in the process. And that's why invention, uh, creative people have very broad interests in science and art and all these areas and not just technical experts in one particular area. So invention has this quality. And then you make a various applied research and, and further product development and you bring it to the market and bring it to reality and that becomes innovation. So one way to uh, describe this, my definition is, uh, my definition of innovation is also grounded in the definition of invention uh, because it's important to see how they're related and how they're different. So in other words, the definition is not a standalone definition. It is in uh, partnered or paired with another definition, namely the definition of innovation is paired with the definition of invention. So as you can see, invention refers to the discovery or creation of a new idea. What one of you said was the answer at the beginning. It is usually, this is interesting, the work of an individual. We talk about a creative genius, a Leonardo da Vinci or a Mozart, etc. And then also invention is by definition outside of reality. In other words, it's a new idea. It's not, a, it's not reality. It's, it's something that did not exist. Therefore, it's not out of reality. So I'm not going to get into all aspects of psychology and psychiatry, but sometimes creative geniuses might have some sort of border on insanity or craziness. People say, well, that's a crazy idea, a new idea, etc. Invention is by definition outside of reality. I'm not saying all creative types are crazy, but there's uh, some connection potentially. And it relates to this concept of being outside of reality. Innovation, in contrast, refers to the combination of inventions, one of you mentioned that, and or institutions of processes around the core invention. So it's a whole aspect to it, not just one idea. And what's interesting is innovation is typically the work of groups, not individuals. So if you look at this process of applied research and going to market and all that, one person is very difficult to do that innovation. So when you say that's an innovative person, that may be partially true, but in general, uh, it takes a village, as it were, to create innovation. Uh, so innovation is typically the work of groups, not individuals, since a variety of capabilities and resources are required. Now, the last sentence is very interesting. Innovation, by definition, takes invention into reality. It takes that crazy idea and makes it into a real idea. This is invent innovation. So I'm going to ask... Uh, uh, I'll finish up uh, this slide. So you have invention, innovation, and then the diffusion of that innovation throughout society or the real world. So I'm going to ask a question. Uh, all of you are familiar with Leonardo da Vinci, the famous Renaissance 
uh, Florentine, Milanese, uh, Italian uh, artists, scientists, etc. And some people say Leonardo da Vinci, the Renaissance man par excellence, the epitome of the Renaissance man, was one of the most innovative people ever in history. How many people, how many of you think that's true? So instead of uh, uh, answering uh, verbally, why don't you go to the chat room and just enter yes or no if you to this question. Was Leonardo da Vinci one of the most innovative persons in history? That's the question. So I get yes, 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 yes. Uh, there's one yes with three S's. Must be very enthusiastic. Everybody says yes. Okay. My answer, I think you can guess because you're already probably knowing my style. My answer is no. And in fact, uh, somebody just said maybe he was more invention than innovation. That's right. So for example, Leonardo da Vinci designed a flying machine. Did it become reality in his time? No. He designed uh, all sorts of other weapons and engineering marvels. The vast majority of them did not become reality in his lifetime. And as a painter, he was extremely creative, extremely inventive, but he created very few paintings. And he was innovative in the sense that some of those paintings have, of course, impacted society tremendously and changed society and have become uh, standard, the Mona Lisa and so forth. But in general, we would describe Leonardo da Vinci as perhaps the greatest inventor or creative of all time, or one of the most, but not necessarily the most innovative. Now we might look at somebody like Bill Gates, kind of boring, not like uh, Leonardo da Vinci, we don't see him painting and he talks and wah, 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 like a true geek and nerd and all that. But one can argue that Bill Gates was much, much more innovative than Leonardo da Vinci. Because right now I'm using a Windows computer. Most of you are doing the same. All the software and how it changed the world and how these ideas came. And not necessarily creative ideas, but he brought some ideas together, brought some operating system and so forth, and created this uh, reality that we're living now. So the yes, kind sir. of, yes. I have a question. Yeah. Um, if you're looking at the new product launching PP, like presentation stuff, they always say their product is innovative. I know, they're Does all it, wrong. They're all wrong. They're, okay. <laughs> they, uh, I shouldn't say I'm being extreme. They, they are not really being correct. Uh, everybody says they're innovative. And everybody says, okay, I woke up this morning and that's really innovative. Oh, I had a cup of coffee this morning and that's really innovative. And I'm joking a little bit, but uh, you're exactly right. It's very interesting. That's why this course exists so that you can really become true innovators and not just fake innovators and just saying we're innovative because we have an e-commerce platform that's like the same as the others, but we're innovative and so forth. Well, uh, now that's not saying that it's bad or whatever. There might be some differentiation. There may be some special features, uh, but the fact that they haven't actually been successful doesn't mean they're innovative. So uh, now we can criticize them and say, oh, they're not using the definition right. And uh, Professor Gorel is an academic, but, uh, and all that. That's not the point. The point is, I mean, if we want to be innovative and really have this impact, make a lot of money, make a good product, help society and so forth, we have to be honest about it. 
And all those presentations, exactly as you pointed out, they do the pitches and we're saying we're very innovative. They're not really honest about it. And ultimately, that is not good for their success. Uh, and um, so it's very interesting that you say that. So I'm not criticizing them so much from an academic standpoint. But ultimately, you know, we really need to be thinking what is innovation in order to, uh, you know, be innovative. And otherwise, we're just deluding ourselves. We're just uh, uh, imagining and uh, hallucinating about what we want to do. So that's a very good point. Uh, the same goes true, by the way. Uh, uh, with disruptive innovation. We're gonna talk later or soon about disruptive innovation. Many people say we have disruptive innovation. And uh, when you really get to the definition of disruptive innovation, which we'll review, what they talk about disruptive innovation is nowhere near disruptive. They just use the word disruptive because it sounds good and they heard it from somebody else and it sounds good so they can get the money from the venture capitalist. Uh, so they throw it in the presentation. Uh, hopefully by the end of this course, all of you will be thinking very hard about innovation uh, and uh, you know, it, trying to exactly understand what is disruptive, what is really innovative, how can we implement that innovation, how can we become reality and um, achieve success. That's why this is a very important course. So let's look at a few case studies. Uh, one of the case studies uh, that we talk about is in the pharmaceutical industry. And this was from a few years ago, and it was with a, uh, had to deal with diabetes. Now, diabetes, uh, as some of you may know, diabetes mellitus is a disease involving blood sugar and specifically low insulin levels. Insulin is the hormone. And diabetics have to inject themselves uh, through the skin with insulin. Insulin is a protein. And if you eat insulin like a pill, it will be broken down and no longer a protein. It will just be the amino acids. So you can't eat, in other words, the technical term, take orally the insulin. You have to inject it. So that's been a big problem. Uh, and one drug company, Pfizer, developed a product, an in invention called Exubera. And this was a way to inhale, breathe in the insulin so that it's absorbed through the lungs where it's not broken down by the stomach acid and the stomach enzymes. And it's absorbed through the lungs and you can inhale it. So you don't have to inject. This was a great idea, creative idea. And there was a lot of science behind this. And what's interesting is this invention did not become reality. They basically had to cancel it. They lost $3 billion. And one of the most expensive failures in the history of the pharmaceutical industry. Now, an important principle comes from this. Uh, namely that doctors and of course uh, drug companies etc they don't really treat the disease they treat patients who have the disease why did this creative useful idea or interesting idea important idea why did it fail the main reason it failed is that this device which you breathe is actually very embarrassing to use and very bulky and not very practical, as opposed to a small uh, uh, injection needle and so forth. So the practical implementation of this ingenious idea was not possible. So they did uh, all this science and technology, but the human element, and that's where the art comes in, the human element, uh, feeling embarrassed, feeling uncomfortable, feeling inconvenienced. These are not scientific concepts, at least not chemistry or biochemistry. These uh, issues prevented the implementation of this new idea. 
and therefore it did not become an innovation. It was a clever idea with some cool science, but it never became reality and never became an innovation. So that's why innovation is not just about some fancy science. There's also the humanistic element or art related to uh, this innovation. Um, yes. Excuse me, I have a question. Um, I believe that in this case, um, the problem is not really rooted in the way that people should consume this insulin or something like that. It's the same like Galileo when he said that uh, the sun does not rotate around earth rather than earth rotates around sun. And it's like there is a group of people who dominate and they sometimes prevent the innovation, that's all. Because I've, I've never seen people who actually injected themselves in front of others. And I don't think people will actually inhale insulin in front of others and feel embarrassed rather than yes. that they will do it alone so it's like maybe innovation is something which is maybe approved by the group of superiors and made on time something like that well yes that's a very good point uh now i should i should emphasize that uh this aspect of embarrassment inconvenience uh, uh difficulty etc the human factors uh, the user friendliness, etc., is different for er everybody. And some people may not obviously use it in public and so forth. But uh, my point is that the human factors were a very important element as people study this. Now, you point out another very interesting aspect is where maybe some powerful people, like the church in the case of Galileo, or the FDA or or other forces, might prevent innovation from coming out. That is very real uh, difficulty, but that did not happen here. At that time, Pfizer was the world's largest, most powerful, richest pharmaceutical company. And they were not in that kind of a position to be suppressed by these, how should I say, uh, superior forces, if you will, which tend sometimes to inhibit innovation. So you're exactly right about that, but it does not apply, at least in not any significant way in this case. In fact, Pfizer, or a very large drug company, can in fact be one of those elements that can suppress innovation by other uh, companies, uh, whether it be through regulation or influencing government or just acquiring and then making it disappear. That's a very real phenomenon, and I'm glad you pointed that out, but I don't think and I'm pretty sure, you know, in the post-mortem of this uh, failure, that it played an important role. In fact, it was approved and so forth. So that's an important phenomena. And we will go over some of those societal aspects that prevent in innovation. Uh, but it did not play a role here. It was more the fact that basically patients were not comfortable with it. And for many reasons, uh, embarrassment, difficulty, inconvenience, and so forth. But thanks for pointing that out. I should also quickly say that uh, uh, this also had unfortunate uh, reminder or, or implications. It looked like devices that are used sometimes to smoke marijuana and other such things. So it looked strange. Uh, so even if it wasn't being done in public, people were you know, very uncomfortable with that kind of association and so forth. So it was very complex, like human, human factors tend to be. Uh, so the second interesting case, which is a very famous case in the business literature, is that of the VHS, uh, which is a Panasonic standard in videotapes versus Betamax, which was the Sony standard in videotapes. Now, all of you are fairly young, so we don't use videotapes that much. Uh, everything's on the phone, TikTok and so forth, MP4 and uh, digital files and so forth. But uh, for a long time, we had these videotapes and of course they still exist. Some of you are of course familiar. And so you had these two types of videotapes and these were the famous videotape wars. And uh, this was in the 1970s and 80s. And what was interesting is that the Betamax was the superior technology. So it was more creative, had more advanced features, was better technology, better science, and so forth. 
but the VHS actually uh, ended up dominating. And that's uh, uh, in this diagram here, uh, VHS, the Panasonic based uh, technology was blue. And so it basically became the dominant design and the Sony Betamax basically disappeared at that time. And this was quite an amazing case. They study it at the business schools around the world. Uh, and I think it's a very important case of innovation, particularly innovation in the context of what is the original invention actually better, but the innovation that prevailed was it the other one, namely the, the VHS. So why was Betamax superior technology at a higher resolution, just a little bit, slightly superior sound, more stable image, and had the Sony quality, et cetera. And there were several factors that led to the VHS becoming the dominant. One was, which was very interesting, is Sony had a proprietary element, whereas the VHS was uh, licensed out by JVC and then Panasonic took it, and many other groups were able to produce VHS. So it was an open technology, and that implied lower cost. Uh, there were some other features that actually were better. One of them was longer recording time that fit the market better. And so that created, even though the core technology might not have been as good, how it was brought to the market uh, organizationally and uh, in terms of uh, market entry and open innovation and so forth, concepts that we'll talk about, enable it to become the uh, dominant design. So which technology was superior? In many counts, Betamax was superior, but in terms of the innovation outcome, VHS ended up being on top. And that again highlights this whole uh, spectrum of activities that are involved in innovation. This course is not about uh, only about being creative. I hope that uh, we will become more creative as a result of, of this course, but that's not the only factor. Uh, we need to understand the wide range of activities related to making that creative idea actually successful. That's case number two. So we're going to answer one more question and then we'll take a uh, break. Uh, which is more important in this whole process? Uh, or what do you think is, uh, you know, if you're going to give us a pitch and you were to say uh, invention or innovation our product is more inventive, our product is innovative, whatever. What do you think is more important, invention or innovation? Yes. Yeah. In my opinion, I, okay. I, I think both of them are important, but um, innovation is more important in terms of our society because innovation is occurred when products are entered to market okay and that's why it makes some process or makes some fields more easy more uh, user-friendly that's okay why. that's good any other thoughts thank you yeah uh, I fully agree and I support this point I would say that innovation does actually address this, like the issues in the society while invention can be a bit too early or a bit too late for example nowadays the the whole world is waiting for the vaccine against COVID-19 and that will be innovation yeah. and that will be useful and expected by the society or by the people but invention will not necessarily be expected of course it can be very useful and it can push the society to like the next step of development. However, innovation is like, it's like, it's more, I think it's more important because it for sure will help the society develop. Great, well, opinion, this, this, uh, sorry. yeah. In my opinion, uh, invention is more important because if you create new thing and then you can just kind of update it. 
Okay. So without any kind of invention, how can you, how it's possible to innovate? Yeah, well, I appreciate uh, Eleonora's uh, answer, Yesu Jonov's and uh, the uh, Jaborov's, excuse me if I'm mispronouncing. Uh, in particular, the Jaborov's answer is interesting because I'm going to give some examples uh, related to that. So, the Jaborov was saying that uh, invention is very important uh, because you have to have that as the beginning, right? But I'm going to talk about another case example uh, of the IBM PC. Uh, the IBM PC, personal computer, uh, some people are are uh, making there's some background noise so if you can mute great thank you uh, so this is the IBM PC and uh, obviously old style computer I don't know if any of you have seen it uh, and this was one of the most innovative products of all time and Dijaborov was talking about uh, invention being very important, but this innovative top uh, product, the IBM PC, one of the most innovative products of all time, with the biggest, with a huge impact, we're still experiencing this impact, had no invention, absolutely no new ideas. And how do I know that? Because Apple had, uh, not the Mac, the early Apple, and then other people were making personal computers. And IBM, the biggest computer company at that time, said, we need to get into this personal computer business, but we need to do it fast. And we're a huge company and we've developed lots of new ideas, inventions, etc. The hard drive was largely invented by IBM. Lots of memory technologies. They have like four Nobel Prize winners are IBM or used to be IBM scientists. They have no problem inventing new things, but they have a specific, they created a team to create the IBM PC and the management, the top management, the CEO of IBM gave instructions to that team not to invent anything. Uh, in other words, they should just use established products, bring them together, and create this IBM PC. They were specifically told not to invent any new chips, not to invent any software, not to invent any new hardware, etc., just to create the IBM PC. And they did exactly that. They used the Intel microprocessor off the shelf. And famously, they used the Microsoft Bill Gates's MS-DOS. And they just put those together and created something that impacted society so much that Time Magazine in that year named the IBM PC the man of the year, the most impactful person uh, at that time in 1982. So this is an example of tremendous innovation with no invention. So it's an extreme example. And I agree that the invention is very important that I'll show uh, shortly. So here's the question, is innovation without invention always good? Well, uh, as I said, with the IBM PC, it is possible to innovate without invention, but in general, Dijaboro is correct. If you have no invention, it's hard to really create innovation. And the perfect example that I'd like to quote is that of the SUV. And this is an SUV. And they were quote unquote innovations, but not really inventions. They refashioned trucks as personal vehicles. They use sophisticated marketing about bigger is better, bigger is safer. Inexpensive gasoline also fit with this in the 1980s. The suburban culture in the United States and so forth. And it created you know, all these things that existed before, no new invention, 
the repurposing that was mentioned, and the SUV. That was an innovation. Now, what was interesting is GM, General Motors, and uh, uh, Chrysler as well, they declared bankruptcy. This was in 2009. And one of the reasons why GM failed was a failure to innovate at the expense of car development. So they're pushing the SUV, and then we have the electric vehicles and other types of new inventions were not happening all the resources going into this non-inventive innovation. And one of the reasons why, you know, Tesla may surpass GM or other companies is Tesla invented and GM did not. So innovation without invention is of course not always good. These are two extreme examples. So, uh, it's 9.55. Let's take a break here for 10 minutes and I will uh, pause the recording and we will continue at uh, 10.05. We'll take a break here and we'll continue at 10.05. So we'll start again now with another distinction in innovation, the difference between product innovation and process innovation. Uh, this is a famous framework for innovation by James Uderbach, Mastering the Dynamics of Innovation out of MIT, where they had the fluid phase, the transitional phase, and the specific phase. Uh, we're not going to go into the details of that uh, today, but what I did want to mention is that there, in these three stages of innovation, we also have two aspects that are very important, of product innovation and then process innovation. And they're both uh, often related for effective uh, innovation or effective implementation of an idea. So this, a lot of people think, well, I have a cool product or I have a cool technology. It's very innovative. I, uh, of course, it's not in the market, but it's innovative. So again, we mentioned that that's not exactly correct, but it's uh, very creative, but uh, it doesn't really enter the market. And that's because often we have to imagine the process around that product. So for example, with the Pfizer uh, Exubera and the insulin, the product was very uh, creative and innovative in a way but the process around that, how it relates to the, how the patient interacted with the product uh, didn't work so well. And uh, that's not the only process, there's marketing and distribution and so forth. So uh, that ultimately failed. So this is very important to understand both of this product and process innovation. Another example is a COVID vaccine. The vaccine may be very ingenious, uh, have a lot of innovative aspects in terms of other vaccines and, and so forth, but in terms of ultimate innovation, if the process to bring it, uh, whether it be production, distribution, convincing people to take it, making it easy to get the vaccine, uh, addressing the whole anti-vaxxer movement and so forth, if those social measures and that process is not done, then we don't get uh, innovation. So. Uh, one example of product innovation is with the MP3 player. So, well, we're going to talk about that later. So an example of process innovation, this is the uh, assembly line for uh, Ford cars. So Henry Ford made the innovation, not just the car, but the whole process and how to produce the car. And that... Uh, concept of assembly line manufacturing was three major elements to sequence the activities step by step to have the workers move a minimum distance from their tools to the car to uh, whatever other resources they were using and to regularize and systematize that work. So a case study number three of this concept of product innovation and process innovation is the Seihan and the Rio, the original, one of the original MP3 players versus the iPod. 
So actually two Korean companies, Korean American, Korean companies, actually invented the first real MP3 player. It was called the Rio, and then also Seihan uh, had a similar device. Most of you don't even, may have not ever seen this device. And this was the first MP3 player. It was the Rio, it was a, a true uh, creative uh, and inventive implementation of the MP3 co concept. And it was innovative to some extent because it was a product that uh, quite a few people had at that time. So that was a product innovation. And the dominant design is not a result of the product innovation, but more process innovation. And the dominant design that it uh, developed was not the Rio, which was invented by Koreans, but actually, as many of you know, the Apple iPod. And many people talk about the iPod as being the dominant design because of the simple user interface, uh, the user-friendly uh, format, and so forth. But what was really, in particular, catalytic for making the iPod successful as a product was the process innovation, namely the development of the iTunes store where people could easily get the music and put it on their iPod. Whereas with the Rio, you had to be a computer scientist uh, or a criminal to get the music. Some of you may remember the story of Napster and free music and downloads and so on and so forth. All that was developing in the 1990s, early 2000s. Uh, and it was very difficult and potentially illegal to get the music onto your MP3 player. Uh, you had to do all sorts of codes, formats, plug it in, this, that, and the other thing on your PC. Uh, there was no easy way. You had to look at websites, download from FTP, et cetera, uh, potentially have people sue you for copyright. It was a mess. So the process was obviously not you know, very good. And uh, even though the core technology, the hardware was fine, and Apple solved that by creating the iTunes, so people pay a little bit of money, 99 cents per song. They don't have to worry about being put in jail. It's very easy to do. They just plug in the iPod, it's synchronized, and that's it. You don't have to be a computer science expert and a programmer uh, to make that happen. So this process innovation was very critical to uh, making the iPod the dominant design. So product innovation and process innovation. We also call this a business model innovation, and we're going to talk about that uh, later in the course. Another very interesting topic, and also one that's confused, is disruptive versus incremental innovation. So one of you had mentioned about uh, startup pitches saying our product is innovative. Well, there are many startup pitches that also say our product or our service is disruptive innovation. And uh, people don't really know always what that means. They think disruptive just means crazy or radical or big or significant or just I feel like saying it. So disruptive versus incremental innovation. And there's actually a very clear framework for understanding the distinction between those. That framework was developed by the late uh, Harvard Business School professor Clayton Christensen in his book, The Innovator's Dilemma. And this visual framework describes the basic theory as well as practice behind disruptive innovation. So what is this diagram? Let's go through it. On the horizontal axis is time over which a company is uh, innovating, bringing new products and so forth. And on the vertical axis is the performance characteristics of those products. And as you can see with these arrows, in generally over time, performance improves or performance increases. But there's several arrows, so we'll discuss that. The first line, is the dotted line here, and that is the nature of customer expectations or needs. In other words, the minimum performance that the customer wants from the product. 
This tends to stay the same, although it may slightly improve over time. People expect uh, better performance in general, uh, better cars, better computers, and so forth. So that is the customer needs performance trajectory. Now, the incumbents or the existing technology, the existing companies will improve their technologies also in an incremental way. So for example, they'll have twice as much memory, they'll have 10% more speed. Uh, for automobiles, they might have uh, a, a few more features, slightly better uh, fuel efficiency, whatever it may be, this incremental uh, innovation, the other word for it is sustaining innovation. And they are above the customer needs. These are the high quality existing companies producing better and better products all the time through incremental innovation. Disruptive innovation are products that are actually low performance, but they have the advantage of either creating new possibilities or more, most importantly, being lower cost. So a lot of people often say, well, we have a disruptive innovation because it's the best performance. It's uh, much better than anything else out there. But the irony is that most disruptive innovations are actually poorer performance, less quality. Uh, and I know that sounds very strange and we're going to explain that shortly. But what's interesting is, even though it's poorer performance in the beginning, at some point, that lower cost uh, innovation, that lower cost product will reach the line of customer needs or customer expectation. And then suddenly the incumbents, which have this high priced, high quality uh, product, get disrupted by the lower quality or lower performance products uh, as soon as the customer needs are satisfied. And that's the point of disruptive innovation. So this is a little bit counterintuitive but we'll see many examples, if you think about it, they're actually true. So let's look at another case study about this. The vacuum tube, which is an electronic component, still used, although very rarely, versus the transistor. The vacuum tube and the transistor are both essentially switching circuits. And as you can see here, there are many advantages to the vacuum tube. There are also many disadvantages to the vacuum tube. And there are many advantages to the transistor, solid state transistor. And in fact, there are many disadvantages to the solid state transistor. So why is it that the uh, transistor, which in many areas is actually less quality uh, than the vacuum tube, uh, how did that become the dominant design? How did that become the by far prevailing switching circuit? Uh, you might see that in very high end audio systems, they use vacuum tubes, not transistors or some of the components of vacuum tubes uh, because of the superior sound quality and so forth. Uh, but the transistor was a disruptive innovation for basically two reasons. One is it was lower cost, incredibly lower cost. And the second is it created new markets. You know, you can't create a smartphone out of vacuum tubes. If you have your smartphone with a vacuum tube, uh, it would be probably the size of all of Tejan or all of Seoul for your smartphone. Your portable phone would be the size of the whole city and uh, use uh, as much uh, energy and so forth. And of course, if one vacuum tube breaks because they're made of glass, then your phone doesn't work. So clearly, uh, all kinds of electronics are enabled by this lower cost, uh, much simpler transistor design. And of course, if you wanna put a million or uh, 10 million transistors or 100 million transistors on a chip, uh, that's only possible with solid state te technology as opposed to 100 million vacuum tubes is not going to fit 
uh, you know, on a chip, obviously it's gonna fit in a whole size of a city and so forth. So the vacuum tube on some levels is superior, but was easily disrupted by the much, 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 much lower cost transistor, which had other advantages of reliability and uh, ruggedness and so forth. So this is a perfect example of disruptive innovation. And we have many other examples, as you can see over history from the 19th century onto the present of disruptive innovation. The transistor, as we mentioned, this is examples of product innovation that are disruptive. The Intel microprocessor that replaced many mainframes. Endoscopic surgery, which is not as perfect as uh, you know, real sur you know, uh, full surgery where you can see everything, the surgeon can see everything. The endoscopic is, is much more trickier uh, and uses less resources, but in the end, of course, has replaced that. There are many benefits to the patient. And uh, eventually doctors could get to the level that they had the enough expertise in, with those instruments to make it happen. Uh, flat panel displays, personal computers, as we mentioned, are disruptive innovations on the product side. And we also had uh, disruptive innovation on the process side. Uh, catalog retailing, discount department stores, Amazon uh, is a process innovation for disintermediation. Uh, so disruptive innovation is, can be on the product or the process side. And of course, many other examples that I haven't necessarily highlighted here. So one interesting aspect is uh, Uber and ride sharing services, a disruptive technology. They say, oh, Uber is a, uh, uh, a, uh, uh, as you know, ride-sharing service. So is disruption any situation in which the industry is shaken up previously successful income and stumble? Well, according to this theory, actually, the answer is no. Uh, Uber was launched in a well-served taxi market. Their customers already have a habit of hiring rides. Disruptive innovations originate in low-end or new market footholds. Uh, so Uber is a kind of outlier. It started in the mainstream market with a competitive, better service in a regulated uh, taxi business. So this was a little bit of a, a strange situation. And part of it was they were entering a business that was highly regulated. So it was disruptive in the sense of replacing. But in terms of what we talked about, low cost and new market disruption, Uber doesn't necessarily fit into that. So another very important concept is that of closed innovation versus open innovation. Uh, closed innovation in terms of management of innovation is a model in which a company or organization uh, has all the innovation process, the invention process within the company. So this is a diagram, we call it the innovation funnel. We have research projects that are inside the company. The boundary of the firm is rigid uh, or not porous. So these projects are inside the company, top secret, so forth. And eventually we outcomes some product into the market. The research phase, development phase. This is the closed innovation model and we'll be talking a lot about this uh, later in the course because this relates to, as we discussed, management of the innovation process. It's very important for business, of course, and in general. This has been uh, developed into what's called an open innovation model. And the key proponent of this is Henry Cheesebro, and this is a book, Open Innovation. And he was uh, now, I think, in the University of California. But in the open innovation model, the boundary of the firm is not tight, but actually allows for exchange or interchange with the outside. So you have research projects coming in, you have research projects maybe spinning out. Uh, then as we develop, you might have uh, entering new markets, you might then get for the current market, you might get companies being acquired, you might have companies or startups being spun out. You might have joint ventures with other companies. This is the open innovation model. 
uh, and not just with other companies, but also with uh, uh, customers and uh, marketing 2.0, engaging with customers, getting their opinions, developing new products and so forth uh, in collaboration with the customers. That is a very much increasing model of innovation uh, going forward. So if we compare closed and open innovation, and here's some quotes, if you will. In closed innovation, the smart people work for us, the company, uh, to profit from R&D, we must discover, develop, and ship it ourselves, do everything. If we discover it ourselves, we'll get to the market first. The company that gets to the market first will win. And we will win if we, as a company, do you know, everything. And we should control our intellectual properties so our competitors don't profit from our ideas. That's very simple, closed innovation. Open innovation is based on the realization that there are lots of smart people all over the world, not just in our company, but outside as well. External R&D can create significant value, and we need some internal R&D to capture that value. We don't need to originate the research to profit from it. There are many examples of companies that build on other products, for example, Apple building on the Rio. Uh, often building a better business model is better than actually getting the product out first. And we saw that example uh, earlier. Uh, and if we make the best use of both internal and external ideas, we will win. And uh, we may want to not necessarily create all IP, but uh, potentially buy or get the rights to other IP. So this is closed innovation as compared to open innovation. And this was in the last 20 years, increasing model of innovation management. Now, many people regard this as being a new idea, but as I uh, alluded to earlier, Rome, ancient Rome that is, uh, the Roman Republic and Empire were among the early original open innovators. Uh, so this is an example of the Roman aqueduct, uh, as you can see, and um, very technologically advanced for that time. And the Romans had many innovations, concrete, which we use now, newspapers, uh, social welfare, bound books, roads, the Roman roads are famous, still existing in some places. The arches, which you can see here, very beautiful, but also very practical. The Julian calendar, which is what we essentially use now. Uh, battlefield surgery was highly developed at that time. And uh, perhaps most importantly was Roman law, which uh, still is, has influence in, in Europe and, and around the world. Now, the reason I highlighted Roman law here is that there was one particular aspect of Roman law, apart from the fact that it was uh, uh, innovative in itself, that uh, enabled innovation. In other words, it was an organizational innovation topic, which we'll talk about uh, shortly. And uh, this picture here is of the 12 tables. And the 12 tables, the du decim, uh, tabulae, were the Roman law. And one of the provisions in the Roman law was that outsiders could become Roman citizens. Uh, and that was called the Latin rite. Uh, and that allowed people from outside Rome to come bring their ideas combined with uh, other ideas and Roman ideas and create all these great innovations. Now, this is very interesting geopolitically because at that time, there were many Italian city-states in the early days of the Roman Republic, which didn't become a uh, full empire. But there were many other Italian city-states with many talented people and powerful resources and armies and so forth. Uh, Sicily, uh, the North, the Etruscans and so forth. But the Romans prevailed because the other cities were much more closed. They did not allow outsiders to be involved as much and to bring their ideas, but the Romans did. And that was probably the most important difference between Rome and the other cities around it 
uh, throughout Italy and the Italian peninsula that enabled Rome to achieve the supremacy that it did not over not only over Italy but all of Europe and uh, eventually the Middle East and North Africa as well. And that's extremely important in our modern days because there's been a lot of uh, talk about uh, nationalism and populism and so on and so forth. And there are significant pressures, or I should say influences here in Korea, for example, in particular, uh, that we should keep everything Korean and uh, for Koreans only and so forth. And uh, in Korea, we have great pride in innovation, but that kind of inward only innovation uh, is unlikely to be sustainable. So these are very important lessons for nations and for companies. So there are many aspects to diversity and so forth, but one of them is related to innovation, which is very central, as I said at the beginning of the course or the beginning of the lecture for success. So another concept that I want to uh, talk about is traditional versus reverse innovation. So in traditional innovation, the developed world typically takes ideas out uh, and or pulled to the de undeveloped or developing world. So this has been the traditional way of innovation. But a increasingly important area is reverse innovation, where um, ideas and processes from the underdeveloped or developing world get actually adopted into the developed world. And this parallels a little bit this concept of uh, disruptive innovation. Remember, disruptive innovation was the lower cost innovation, was the new market innovation, that eventually reaches the right level that customers will accept and becomes disruptive. So reverse innovation in a geopolitical or geographic setting is one way in which disruptive innovation is uh, developed. So reverse innovation as a source of disruptive innovation. So we talked about uh, the price and the performance uh, constraints drive innovation towards a disruptive technology. We talked about this, uh, and the disruptive technology becomes a high value product as it improves. It can be transferred from poor to rich markets through reverse innovation. So, disruptive innovation and reverse innovation have close uh, interaction. So, the final point that I want to make is the concept of organizational innovation. Uh, open innovation is a form of organizational innovation, but I want to talk more broadly about how we may innovate on innovation. This was another Harvard Business School professor who wrote a book called Science Business, Gary Pisano. And what's interesting about what he wrote is that there's an important connection between technology and organizational structure. In other words, if we look at the modern day corporation, or for that matter, the little startups that try to be eventually like the big corporation, these large corporations, these organizational forms uh, developed about 150 years ago uh, in the context of the development of rail and telegraph systems. Rail systems or transportation systems enabled centralized factories, resources to come in. So we had Detroit with the American car industry and we saw that Henry Ford assembly line. So the rail allows for the uh, centralization of uh, production on the material or matter side. Telegraph systems, uh, allowed for the centralization of information and knowledge. So you had central headquarters controlling uh, the outside uh, sales departments and subsidiaries and so forth. And so the modern day corporation with centralized factories and centralized uh, headquarters and command and management systems were enabled by technology 150 years ago. 
But the reason why this book Science Business was interesting because it was talking about biotech startups and the same can be true of you know, other startups is innovating how we innovate. If we have new technologies such as social media, messaging, uh, now this whole uh, Zoom thing with uh, courses and uh, online teaching, and then we have decentralized production with 3D printing, uh, with uh, uh, manufacturing on demand, uh, small micro factories, all these sorts of things. New technologies should create new organizational structures. So this may sound very radical, but is the corporation uh, in the world of open innovation and even more disruption in terms of organizational disruption, are corporate entities actually relevant? Are there going to be other organizational forms in the future? And this also relates to startups. Everyone dreams of being a startup and being an entrepreneur and becoming the next Microsoft or Amazon or whatever, but that implies that you create a uh, unitary company, it, it grows, uh, you go IPO and all this, uh, but maybe the organizational forms 10 years from now, 20 years from now, and even now are changing. Maybe just creating a startup like that and then going for an IPO, that classic pattern may not work or may not exist. Uh, because it doesn't support disruptive open innovation as efficiently. So we need to be thinking about organizational innovation, innovating innovation, in other words. So I'll ask the class again, what is innovation? Uh, we asked that question at the beginning. So let's go around, uh, not to everybody, because we have uh, many people here, but who wants to answer the question now after our two hours of lecture? Who wants to start? Uh, may I answer? Sure, Jean. Yeah, <clears throat> so uh, uh, innovation is um, bring new idea to, uh, re re to re reality. Okay, great. Who else wants to answer? Thank you. Uh, let me do addition for this. Yeah. Uh, as, my, as I understand that uh, innovation is to update the existing idea to reality. I mean. Great. Uh, who else wants to answer? Yeah. Me, professor. Who's that? Okay. Um, it's me. Okay, Gang Hang. Gang. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's Maro. Yeah, Mara. Uh, yeah. In my opinion, innovation is what leads us to development. And without innovation, there will be no rivalry and competition in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. Very good. What's uh, Who else wants to answer? If you're giving the same answer, uh, it's not a bad uh, thing. Yeah. Uh, I think... Innovation is improving some process or some field by implementing existing technology. Right. So basically, innovation is new ideas or existing combinations, new combinations of old ideas that are made into reality, uh, that are uh, become, enter the market that uh, make an impact on society, that uh, is connected very much to success of the business. This is one reason why innovation is so critical because if we look at the definition of innovation, it is the definition of success actually. So if you are good at innovation, uh, by definition, you will be uh, successful. And of course, innovation will help being successful. So. Uh, and also one reason why this is a very important class is that this innovation process is many things from the science to the art to the marketing to the uh, manufacturing, all these things, which we won't go in depth in each of those, of course, 
There are separate courses about marketing, separate courses about manufacturing, supply chain, and so forth. But uh, true innovation requires an ability to bring all of these things together to have your new idea into reality. So uh, we will talk about creativity, and it's important to be creative, as we said, uh, although sometimes you can be innovative without being creative, by the way, as we also mentioned. Uh, but that's not the only part of uh, the course. So uh, let's go through uh, a few uh, practical aspects. Course methods. So we will have 14 lectures uh, following an interdisciplinary convergence philosophy. So as you saw already, we, we did some uh, electronics. We talked about uh, uh, medicine and pharmaceuticals. We talked about the history of Roman Empire, uh, MP3 players. Uh, we talked about social aspects and so forth. So there's many different things that are gonna come together. So this is a, what I call interdisciplinary convergence philosophy. Uh, the classes, not Mondays, excuse me. Why did I say Mondays? Uh, Fridays. So I'll update this. Uh, and uh, the attendance. is pair soul bridge uh, regulations. And I should say here, uh, start of each lecture, enter your student ID and name in the Zoom chat room. Very important. Okay. Uh, obviously, all lectures and discussion will be in English. Uh, we will have a weekly assignment, which will be just short paragraphs, like a question. And I will put those both in the uh, Google Calendar for that day and in the LMS. And you should answer, though, through the LMS. So just answer uh, through the LMS system. Uh, very short. And then we're going to have at the end of the class, three short projects, about one or two pages. Uh, I thought we were only going to have 20 students, but we have 40. So I don't think it will be possible to give presentations. Uh, but uh, I'll, I'll still have to think about that. <laughs> Excuse me. And there may be uh, a special sort of project. I'm still thinking about how we're going to implement this. Uh, my style is to innovate. Uh, for example, I don't know if your other professors had some music during the break, but I decided to come up with a new idea and pipe some music through. And so you had the music through the break. Uh, so I like to do things innovatively. So I'm thinking of what kind of innovative special project we might do as part of this uh, course. So I'm still thinking about that. Um, obviously, if you have any suggestions, feel free to, to let me know of things that you might want to do. But this is the basic aspect of the course. The lectures, the short paragraphs, and the three short projects. Now, in terms of grading, the discussion and participation, and mainly the short paragraphs, will be 25%. The three short one-page papers, or two-page, one to two-page papers, will be 75%, in other words, 25% each of them. Uh, and that's the basic grading, very simple. Uh, these are my contact information. As I said, I'm on LinkedIn, uh, happy to connect there as well. I think I sent uh, all of you uh, uh, invitations. Uh, next week, we are going to talk about biology. Now, this is not a biology class. I don't know how much of you have taken biology, but we will talk about biology. In particular, we will talk about adaptation and evolution, innovation and biology. The concept of evolution as a paradigm for innovation. How do new species get formed? 
the dinosaurs, human beings, and all that. We're going to discuss uh, innovation and develop a framework based on biology because probably the most powerful system for innovating is biology. You know, human beings, how do they come here? They, you know, we have all these capabilities, very incredible uh, anatomy, physiology, etc. How did that happen? That's an innovation. We're reality. We rule the planet, right? And other living beings. How did that happen? You know, we didn't just appear out of nowhere. And that's the process of evolution that has created this innovation, which is our reality now. And so we're going to study that next week. And this framework, how evolution works, will be a very good framework for how uh, innovation works in other frames, such as in business or whatever. So by the end of tomorrow, we'll have a good understanding of evolution and some uh, biological uh, innovation. I will post the short question for next week, but uh, I'll tell you now what it is. Uh, you should write down in one paragraph, one example of something very innovative in biology. What do you think is a very innovative thing in biology? A new uh, organ, new system, whatever it is, new species, new adaptation uh, that you think is very cool, very interesting, novel, and of course, successful, which is innovative. So that's next week. And then now, maybe by next week, I'll be able to figure out this special project. But if you have any suggestions, for things that you might want to see or do in the class, please uh, email me uh, <clears throat> and that'll be hel helpful as well. Okay, any questions? Um, professor? Yeah. Uh, I, might have, I might have misheard, but uh, did you send the Google Drive link to our no, it's emails? not. It's not Google Drive. It's Google Calendar. Ah, it's Calendar. Yeah. yeah. So, so I will. The, I will not be using Google Drive for file exchange. The files will be right. attached to the Google Calendar. Although indirectly, they're actually through my Google Drive, by the way. But uh, they're through the calendar, and the LMS will also have the files. So there is no Google Drive invite. It's Google Calendar. Yeah. So did you send did you send these through the email? Yes, through email. Everybody should have it. So uh, I'll pull up the Google Calendar. Where is this? So, uh, here's Saliev Shakpozkon. Uh, yes, that's me. And I sent it to your mail.ru. So maybe it's in your spam box or whatever. So, uh, yeah, I just checked it, but I couldn't find it. <laughs> So strange. Okay, so then if you haven't, uh, if you haven't, uh, this is actually a good question. Thank you. Well, I wasn't implying that it wasn't a good question. Uh, so I appreciate it. There are two things. One is if you have not received this Google Calendar invitation, then send me an email. And the second thing, uh, my email is ogangorel at gmail.com. The second thing is that Google Calendar, of course, works better with Gmail. So if you have a Gmail address, and I have some of your Gmail addresses, then please send me an email uh, from your Gmail or with your Gmail address, so then I can add you through the calendar that way. Okay. Yes, so thank any, you. Thanks. Any other questions? Professor? Yeah. Uh, can, you, can you please check for me that, uh, have you have my email? yet 
Well, I uh, let, okay, so here's the thing. We have 40 people here. I don't want to spend everyone's time checking individually. If you did not receive the invite, please send an email to, to my email address. So, There it is, ogangarel at gmail.com. I'm also on LinkedIn. So instead of going through each person uh, one by one here in a public setting, uh, just check. If it's not there, just send me an email. And preferably your Gmail or set up a Gmail because it will be a little bit easier. It's not required, but it will be a little easier. Any other questions? Uh, there's a question, when do we have to hand in the assignment? Uh, so that will be before the class. So in the next day or two, I'll post it on LMS and before next Friday, you submit it. So every assignment will have the deadline, but in general, it will be before the class.